thing. Paul was very aware of the reality that this life is not the end of life. And, and uh, so a lot of his writing has a very forward-focused vision to it. Meaning, we do this because of this, and then he looks off into the distance. And that's an important aspect of living life. If you do not understand the, the direction of which life is going, what you're doing now has no meaning to it. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, when he says, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. We're going to look at 26 and 27 and 28. We're going to look at these verses and break down. It's, this is what we call expository preaching. The goal today, you can tell me afterwards whether we did it, is to expose the text, to expose you to what he was saying in the context of what he was saying, so that you have a better understanding, not of what Scott Beyer thinks, that's not going to get you anywhere, but to give you an exposure to what the words of the Holy Spirit are. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, Paul writes and he says, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. One good way to properly understand text is to take things that are said in the Bible and try and find another word that means the same thing. And by trying to find it, a lot of times it helps you to understand what's being said. So in the case of, I run in such a way as not without aim. What does it mean to not have aim? Well, if you're without aim, you're not aiming at the thing. And in fact, a life without aim is, we have a word for it, aimless. A life without aim is aimless. And then you ask the question, you say, well, why is Paul saying I need to live a life, I need to run in such a way that I'm not aimless? One of the, the first things you do, can begin to do is say, well, do other people live aimless lives? I'll tell you, that is an epidemic. We live in a country with so much, so much plenty, so many, many opportunities to do good, so many opportunities to do whatever you want. You want to learn it, you want to uh, be involved in it, you want to participate in it, you can. And, and yet the reality is, is the vast majority of people are living aimless lives. It's interesting, we have this epidemic in society right now that they're, they're very easily able to monitor, which is we have able-bodied men. Able-bodied meaning you are, have the capability to work who are voluntarily removing themselves from the workforce. An interesting phenomenon. It's not one we've really ever seen in America. Typically, when you talk about unemployment numbers and things like that, historically, the, the concern is always we have people who want to work, but we don't necessarily have enough jobs or training for them. We're, we're running into a very uh, opposite pro problem. We have people who are able to work, but find no reason to do it. That's aimlessness. Aimlessness is when I, I have the ability to do something, but I find myself not doing it because it's not aiming towards anything. And, and really, you know, they have these things, these jokes that, that, that people tell, and we, we laugh about it because there's a certain feeling this way of hopelessness in adulting. And we call it adulting now because it's the most childish way to say being an adult. And we're, we're adulting. And in adulting, we have this problem like you become an adult and now. Um, the, the joke is adulting is figuring out what you're going to eat for dinner and then you die. Adulting is working to pay bills until you die. Adulting is uh, going through life and um, having to fix things until you die. This is, this is, they're funny, right? Because in one sense that, that is something they don't tell you. Is that part of being an adult is that you're going to have to figure out what you're going to have to eat for dinner every night for the rest of your life until you die. It's funny in one sense, but in another sense, do you hear the aimlessness? Do you, do you hear the sense of why would I want to grow up if? Why would I want to work a job if? 
why would I want to make responsible decisions if that's the end result? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, Paul is addressing the reality of being a human being. If you do not have a good reason to do something, you will not do that thing. Inevitably, anything without purpose dies. You do not take care of things that don't have purpose. In fact, when I feel aimless, we're going to talk about several things, three things right now that happen when I feel aimless. One of the easiest places to go is to go to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Because in Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14, I'm not going to look at a specific verse, but, but if you read through Numbers 13 and Numbers 14, read through those chapters, you read through this kind of shorter synopsis of some of their time wandering in the wilderness. That's what we call it, wandering in the wilderness. What is wandering? It feels aimless. And they wander in the wilderness, and what do you most associate with that time of wandering? Complaining. Because why are we doing this? I'm the son of math teachers. Son of math teachers. I come from math stock. Okay? And yet I will tell you in my deepest and darkest moments of calculus, why am I even doing this? Right? You have that, right? You have some, at some point in your educational process, you run into something you're doing that you cannot connect to where it would be used. And that's, and, and when that happens, all of a sudden, you're, you are no longer actively engaged in your own education. You find reasons to complain. You find other things to do. You, you act unhappy because you are unhappy. Aimlessness is an epidemic that leads to complainers. Now ask yourself, in America, do we like to complain? It's, it's more of a sport than the NFL. I mean, look, we, we made it a pastime. You get 16 weeks of professional football. You get 52 of complaining, right? I mean, it's, this is the world that we live in and we find complaining is our way of coping with it. That's what people are doing. You're coping with it. And if you look at the children of Israel in the wilderness, and if you think of that time out there, and we're just wandering around, and we're going to be out here, and we don't know why we're out here, and we don't know how long we're going to be out here, and there's no purpose to it, and all I can think about is, this has no meaning to me, it is not surprising they complain. Now, there's. There's a, another piece to that puzzle, right? Which is, was there a reason they were out there? Yes. Was there a plan? Yes. Were they focused on it? Absolutely not. And when you're not focused on it, you complain more. The other thing you do is you just simply work less. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which is one of the thematic verses for this quarter, where, we, where we've been talking about every soul needs purpose. Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, For we are... His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Ephesians 2.10 says you were created by God for good works and you are his workmanship and he expects you to do good things. Ephesians 2.12 says before you didn't know that and you were without hope and without God. I don't work if I don't know why. Now, there's, there's going to be times with God just like there are times with children with parents where the reason you work is because... I said so, right? Why do we have to do this? Because I'm bigger than you. And it's not just that, but it is kind of that, right? Why? Because I'm the parent and you're the child. Sometimes the reason is pretty vague. There are some times where God tells us to do things and he's somewhat generic about why. 
He's not going to give you every detail of what's going to come next. He's not going to tell you, well, actually, I need you to do this because three days from now, this thing's going to happen. And then after that, this thing's going to happen. And if you are following my commandments, you'll be ready for those things. And I have this great and amazing thing that's going to happen in your life and I want to use you for. He's not going to, he's not going to send you an itinerary for your life. But he does send you purpose. When the children of Israel left the land of Egypt, he said, I did not make you to be slaves. I am pulling you out of that so that you can become a great and mighty nation. What was the first step of being a great and mighty nation? You have to wander around the wilderness for a little while. But if you remember what's God made us to be, a great and mighty nation, then you're okay with the wandering. But if you forget the purpose, you stop working. Ephesians 2 tells us God has good and great work for us to do that he made for you to do. If you, if you forget that piece of it, then Sunday morning stays Sunday morning. What the job of a Christian is to do is to wake up Monday morning with the stuff that we talked about Sunday and say, this is what I'm made for. Now let me get up and do that good work because I'm not without hope and I'm not without God. How is it that you can have a Christian who can have a dead-end job, like a, just a job they just don't like, and they can get up and work that job with a smile on their face? How can they do that? Not because the job is good but because they understand the purpose of working for a master in heaven. Yeah, maybe this job that I have today isn't great, but the God that I have is great, and so I'm going to give him the best no matter what circumstance I'm in. Why put effort into your marriage when you feel like your spouse isn't putting that effort in? Which, by the way, will happen at some point. At some point, you're going to feel like you're putting more effort into your marriage than your spouse. Is that going to be accurate? Probably not. Probably not. But you're going to feel like you're putting more effort into that marriage than they are putting in. Why do that? And the answer is, without hope and without God, there's no good reason. Because the last thing you should do is put more, put more effort into something than the other person you're partnering with. It should be equal at all times or not worth doing. But when you add God to the equation, everything changes. You were made by God for good work. If you forget that purpose, you become aimless. Right? If, if you get into your mind that my job is to find happiness here on earth, and then inevitably you don't find that happiness because happiness happens, and sometimes it doesn't. You ever notice that? Happiness is something that happens to you. That's the very root of the word. Happiness happens to you. Happiness happens to you, and what happens on the day where it doesn't happen to you, all of a sudden you feel aimless. And so you stop working, because this doesn't work. You've got to keep your mind out on the thing. We, we run as though, not as those without aim. That's a literal reference to the idea of running a marathon, the, the Greek Olympics. And if you run a long-distance race, right, you watch uh, track and field, you know, a lot of the track and field events, they can see the end at the beginning. Right? You have the higher mirror dash, and it's like, well, where do you end? There. And so they've got technique, and they work hard and everything, but at every moment, they can see the finish line. But when you run a marathon, you go around one bend, not there. Go around the next bend, not there. Go around the next bend, not there. I remember I was running this last year's race, and it was on a course that I'm familiar with. And I don't run a marathon because I'm not crazy. I run a half marathon. I'm half crazy. It's a fine line to walk. But I'd run the course before. And there was a guy who was faster than me, but he'd never run it before. That also is a common theme in my life. But he was running... And at one point, he started looking around, and I could tell he didn't know where, where he was, and he didn't know how far he had left. And so I just 
quickly said to him, I said, okay, so we're going to go down this little hill. We're going to take a right around here. Then you're going to take a quick left. You'll go down, and then you take a right. And when, when you take that right, that's the end. You're going to see the finish line. And he goes, thank you. And then left me behind. <laughs> but that's aim. That's aim. What happened was he needed to know where the finish line is. We just read in 2 Corinthians where the finish line is. In this body, it's a tent and we groan. Why should I work? Where's the finish line? The finish line is at the end. And it's glorious. And it is so much better because Paul compares your body to a tent. But then Jesus says, my father has many dwelling places for you. See the difference? A tent is a temporary place. And look, I, it doesn't matter how nice the tent is. It's still a tent. A house is a house. And you're living in a tent. Sometimes the rain fly didn't get put on right, and all of a sudden you're sleeping in water. Sometimes it's cold outside, and sometimes that wind gets to blowing, and you think, I don't have anything sturdy to take care of me. I remember one time we were in here in the middle of a thunderstorm, and lightning struck, and then there was this giant thunder right in the middle of my sermon. It was so cool. It was the best addition to my point ever. And people laughed and smiled. You think we would have laughed and smiled if that thunder had clapped right over our heads and it was a tent we were in? Be like everyone in your cars, sermon over. The quality of structure matters. Right now you live in a tent. But you look forward to a, a mansion, to a dwelling place in the heavenly realm. So you work because you have aim. The other thing that's interesting is Exodus 14, to go back to the Israelites, they go out in the wilderness. And in Exodus chapter 14, 1 through 4, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pi-Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea, and you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it by the sea. Worst part of my sermon is naming those names. For Pharaoh will say, listen to this, for Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. God sends Israel out into the wilderness and they begin to wander around. Are they actually aimless? No, God's in charge. But what does Pharaoh think? Pharaoh thinks in his heart, these people are wandering aimlessly. I'm going to go get them back. Aimless things look like prey. People who do not have goals and purpose look like prey. Satan works that way. If you do not know what your life is about, he'll figure it out for you. He has absolutely no problem tempting you because, again, if, if I am aimless, I'm complaining more, and I'm working less, and so he just has to offer some little temptations to me, and all of a sudden, off I go. Look at the story of David and Bathsheba, that whole, whole event. It is not a mistake that it was included, that it says it was the time in which the kings go out to war. Purpose, meaning, and where was David? Back at home, wandering around the rooftop. He, it was the time where a king has his purpose, his meaning. We go to war, we go fight, we increase the land, we protect the people. That's the time the kings do what kings do. And instead, David was home and he was tempted because aimless people become prey. So understand, it's not just about becoming a better Christian. Yes, I do think that having purpose and aim will make you a better Christian. I, I believe all of that. But I also believe that if you do not have purpose and aim, it is likely at some point you will cease to be a Christian. Because Satan is perfectly comfortable to take care of the sheep that have wandered 
away aimlessly. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, he says, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. We were in an airport in 2020. We were on our way to go pick up our son. And if you remember, 2020, some stuff happened. And so we're in the middle of this pandemic. And I, go, I remember going into the airport restroom because we're going to go take this long flight to Florida. Back when I lived in Washington, it was a long flight back then. We're going to take a long flight to Florida, and so I'm going to go use the restroom. And I go in the restroom, and they're piping in over the intercom system or whatever, instructions for how to wash your hands. And that, you know, people are dying. And so they're, they, we don't know a lot of the things that we know now. There's, and, and it was a scary time. Like, no matter what, you can always, 2020 in hindsight's interesting, isn't it? But at the time, we were all very scared. And so I'm going to take this fly, and there's instructions being piped in on how to wash your hands, and I learned something. I've never in my life washed my hands properly. I don't know if any of you have had that experience of, like, once they start telling us how you're supposed to wash your hands. Apparently, I've been gross my entire life. I had the airport explain to me how a real human being is supposed to wash their hands. And I'd never done it that way before. Because the entire time that I've ever washed my hands, my entire life up to that point, I'm going to be honest with you and be a little bit vulnerable, so don't be mean about it, was just so I didn't get in trouble. I just washed my hands as a child growing up, all the way up, so that I didn't end up being that person that people knew didn't wash their hands and thought was gross. So I would always kind of like, just do it. But now I'm in an airport on the way to see my son, and the world is on fire. And they're explaining to me how to wash my hands. And for the first time in my whole life, I wash my hands. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I don't want to die today. Like I'm actually doing it for the very first time. And you know why? Because I have purpose. Because I have purpose. If you're a surgeon and you wash your hands, you wash it different. I hope you wash it differently than the average person because you have purpose to it. You're thinking about it. When you go through life, he says, I box in such a way as not beating the air. I'm aiming for something. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What am I trying to accomplish? Right? If what I'm trying to accomplish is to not get in trouble from my parent, so I wash my hands, that's one goal. If I'm trying to save lives, I wash my hands differently. And then the other is, how do I define success? As a kid, how do kids brush their teeth? And they go in, you say, time to go brush your teeth. How do kids brush their teeth? And if you say, my kids brush their teeth beautifully, you are lying to yourself. You are lying to yourself. Kids do not brush their teeth like that. Kids like, first of all, my kids typically brush their teeth at my sink. Don't know why, just the habit, and I have to deal with it. It's like mayhem there. There's toothpaste everywhere but in their mouth. But the other piece is, like, it's very hurried and rushed, right? Their goal is, how long do I have to stay in here so dad doesn't send me back? That's one way to brush your teeth, right? How do I define success? Oh, I stayed in long enough so that dad didn't send me back and say, yeah, do it again. But if you're, you're defining success of brushing your teeth as my teeth are clean, it's a different process, isn't it? Are you living life as a Christian simply asking, how much do I need to do so God doesn't get mad at me? Because if that's how you're defining the success, you're missing the point. If you are going through your Christianity simply asking yourself, how long do I have to do this stuff that God says in a way that he doesn't send me back and say, try again. You're missing the 
point to have aim in your Christianity is to define success differently. And I, I do think the key goes back to Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I want to know what good works he made me for. And the only way I'm going to figure that out is if I start brushing my teeth. If I start cleaning myself up, if I start purifying myself, if I start trying things and doing things that make me uncomfortable but lead me down that path so I can figure out what kind of workmanship I am. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, he says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. Now, the scriptures are very clear. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, all discipline, all, all discipline, three-letter word, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. All discipline, whether that be discipline given to you or self-discipline. What we're talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 is self-discipline. Self-discipline is an interesting thing because I'm disciplining myself. I'm in charge of it. But what does Hebrews 12, verse 11 say about discipline? All discipline is not joyous. It doesn't seem to be joyful. Anytime that I try and improve myself, I'm not going to enjoy it. And some of us have made the confusing crossing of wires in our mind that if Christianity isn't fun, or if I'm not good at it naturally, I must, it's either not for me, or I must be doing it wrong. No, it's the exact opposite. Self-discipline requires purpose to understand, I'm going to go through this entire process of learning things and becoming things, and I'm not good at it now, and it's going to be hard, but it's just going to be worth it. I will tell you that if you have had that feeling of saying, this is a very big book, the very first time I actually, actually picked this book up and actually started thinking about how big it is and all the stuff that's supposedly in there, I was overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. And I wasn't good at it. And nobody I know of is. But if you have the purpose of saying, this is God's letter to me, it becomes worth the self-discipline of not feeling good about it for a while. Self-discipline requires purpose, and purpose requires self-discipline to bear fruit. If you know your purpose, but you don't discipline yourself, you will never bear fruit. And this is the, the thing that often happens. There's lots of people who know the right thing to do, but don't do it. That's why so much of Christianity is, is not really complicated. I mean, you're not going to hear me get up in the pulpit and say a lot of things that are just shocking. But, but the reality is, is that we know what it is, but a lot of times it requires us to discipline ourselves, and all discipline seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. And so we stop. But if you understand that, that that purpose that God has for you only happens when you, when you put in the self-discipline. That's only when you get the fruit out of the tree. That's the only way you get to that point. Then all of a sudden things change. That's why Paul says, I discipline my body and I make it my slave. That's not an enjoyable process. Telling yourself no is not an enjoyable process. It's just one that's worth it. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Very quickly, and then we're going to close down. I want, I want you to think about what does it mean to have aim as a Christian? What it means is to be qualified. The aim of Christianity is to be qualified. I myself, I, Paul's living in such a way, he says, so that I myself will not be disqualified. We'll put that in the positive. He wants to be qualified. And qualified people have quality. If you go and you look at Peter's writing, Peter talks about these things, these qualities, these character traits that build on each other. Faith and moral excellence and knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. He says, if these 
qualities are yours and are increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your aim as a Christian is to take that list and get better at it. That's it. Just take that list, pick something on it, and this week say, I'm going to get better at it. I'm going to get better at self-control. No, nah, don't pick that one. I'd pick a different one. I'm going to get better at brotherly kindness. Pick one. I'm going to get better at moral excellence. That's the, the trait of having virtue. Like, if, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it well. Pick a trait, learn about that trait, and then say, I'm going to increase in it. Because if these tr qualities are yours and are increasing, you will not be disqualified. But the other piece of that is the reason that Peter writes this way and the reason that Paul writes this way is qualities don't happen by accident. You will not accidentally become somebody with faith, moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. You will not wake up one day and it just happened. In fact, the opposite is true. You do not aim. You will wake up one morning and you will wonder, why am I not a better person? How did that happen? It happened because you didn't. You have to choose purpose. The qualities that we are to have and that ought to be increasing are ones that are aimed at. But when you're aiming, you're not complaining. When you're aiming, you have a reason to work. And when you're aiming, you aren't prey. You go on the offense. And you live your life accordingly. And with that, I leave the sermon with you. Because ultimately, every sermon, that's exactly where all of them belong. It does no good as long as it stays up here. But if you take something from it, if you can benefit from something that Paul wrote, and then go live your life accordingly. That's what the word is meant to be. Not merely for hearing, but for doing. If you're not yet a Christian, here's the thing you need to do. There comes a point where you have to move from hearing to doing. And the thing that you need to do, you need to follow Jesus. And that requires baptism. It requires you repenting of your sins, confessing Him as Lord, and being baptized into Christ so that your sins can be washed away. If we can help you with that, please come forward and stand and sing.